Santa Monica and was seen at a pawn shop begging for $3 to buy a slice of pizza. Now after that, he went to rehab and wanted to commit to sobering up and staying clean again. In 2007, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman got their own reality show called The Two Corys on the A&E Network. But the show didn't last beyond two seasons after an argument when Corey Feldman told Corey Haim on the show that he'd been asked to star in the Lost Boys sequel and Corey Haim was not called to be in the movie. Another problem they had on the show was Corey Haim was still doing drugs while taping. Years later, the two Corys put their issues aside and rekindled their friendship. But on March 10th, 2010, Corey was running a fever and asked his mom to come into the room because he was having breathing problems. Around midnight, she saw him walking around the room, then he collapsed to the floor, and his body began to shake in all directions, and his eyes rolled back. She called 911 and performed CPR until the paramedics arrived. Once in the paramedics' care, by 2.15 a.m., he was pronounced dead. His autopsy revealed that he had traces of several prescription drugs and over-the-counter drugs in his system, but that's not what killed him, though. He died of natural causes from pneumonia that damaged his lungs and an enlarged heart and narrow blood vessels. After Corey Haim's death, Corey Feldman released his book titled Choreography. Now, in the book, he said that him and Corey Haim were victims of sexual abuse and passed around to child predators. Now, Corey Feldman also said that Corey Haim told him that he was raped by Charlie Sheen when he was 13 while they was filming the movie Lucas together. Charlie Sheen denied the allegations that he sexually assaulted Corey Haim and Corey Haim's mother, Judith Haim, claimed a man named Dominic Brasha raped her son, not Charlie Sheen. Now see, Corey Feldman and Dominic Brasha were best friends and they played in the movie Friday the 13th, A New Beginning Together in 1985. Corey Feldman introduced him to Corey Haim. Now Corey Feldman said he's trying to raise $10 million to fund a movie to shed light on Hollywood's alleged pedophile ring. But Judith Haim, mother of Corey Haim, said that Corey Feldman is a scam artist and he's always been jealous of her son since they were teens and now he's trying to profit off her son's life. In July 2016, she sent Corey Feldman a cease and desist letter threatening to sue him if he didn't keep her son's name out of his mouth. And he took a job shining shoes in a white owned shoe parlor. And during that time, the Jim Crow days, black people were not allowed to use the same restrooms as white people. So Dick Rowland had to go to another building to use the bathroom. And when he got in the elevator with the elevator operator, who was a 17 year old white girl named Sarah Page, something happened. Something happened in the elevator, but nobody really knows. People just heard, they just heard her scream and Dick Rowland ran out. What they think happened is Dick Rowland lost his balance and stepped on her foot or grabbed her arm and startled her. Now, after that incident, the newspapers was trying to say he raped her in which angered the white people and they arrested him and they wanted to lynch Dick Rowland. But black army war vets from Black Wall Street, they came down with guns to protect Dick Rowland from being lynched. And that's when the big riot broke out and the white people ended up burning down Black Wall Street. Now, survivors from the attack said it was large white mobs. They was looting and burning businesses and homes down. And the black community they tried to fight they tried to defend their homes and their businesses until the white people chartered airplanes and started dropping bombs 
Wow. That's messed up. And when they did that, it was over, man. They say over 300 to 500 people were killed, leaving survivors with nothing. That's a shame, man. They were sleeping in tents and everything. They, they left them with nothing. Now, the crazy part is the girl, Sarah Page, she never pressed charges. And she went to Kansas City. And guess what? Dick Rowland was never charged. And he went to Kansas City too. Hmm. Now, some rumors try to say that they had been romantically involved and reunited for a while in Kansas City before going separate ways. But some people say that white people just made the whole thing up and was just looking for a reason to destroy the city because they were jealous. Now, most of the survivors, they are dead now, but you can go back and check their interviews out on YouTube and listen to what they say happened because for years, the powers that be try to cover this Black Wall Street thing up. And to this day, there are only two tombstones of survivors and nobody knows where the rest of the 300 to 400 people that died was buried. You know what, man? This story is so deep. I'm going to have to do a whole episode dedicated just to Black Wall Street because it's a lot more things, man, I didn't get into that y'all need to know. Like the Indians and the Black Slaves and that Trail of Tears. Oh, my God. If y'all know what the Trail of Tears is, that's when President Andrew Jackson, he gave the Indians blankets with smallpox in it. And there's more other things, too, like the Red Summer in 1919 that started in Chicago. It's a whole bunch of stuff that ties into the beginning of Black Wall Street. You know, I'm going to let y'all y'all come up with a name for a series that I can do where I can just talk about stuff like Black Wall Street, the Trail of Tears, and a lot of history stuff. I'm going to let y'all name the series. And you know, to be honest, man, they really need to make a movie about this. They need to make a movie about this. Another good thing, though, what I heard was, um, I heard it was some black families, man. They brought a bunch of acres in Georgia and was trying to create a black city like Black Wall Street not too long ago. I want to say like 2019 or something like that This happened. There was some black families and um, they bought a whole bunch of acres in Georgia. Still in her late teens, she moved to America to pursue a career in modeling and music in New York, where she hooked up with super freak funk legend Rick James. In 1982, she met another legend by the name of Prince when she was Rick James' date at the American Music Awards, and Prince persuaded her to join his girl group Vanity Six. Shortly after, they began a romantic relationship. Now joining Prince and his entourage, Prince gave her the name Vanity because he considered her to be the female version of himself. Prince's vision for the girl group was a hooker's theme project. He originally suggested that she use the stage name Vagina, but instead they agreed upon Vanity. But that whole image that Prince created for her really wasn't the path she wanted to go. Vanity claimed that Prince urged her to flaunt her sexuality and she only did it because if she didn't, she wouldn't get paid. She really wanted the old Diana Ross singer-actress image. The group Vanity Six recorded one album and had some success internationally with the single Nasty Girl. The song went number one on the US Hot Dance Club play chart. Vanity also was the cover model for two of the group Cameo's albums, Alligator Woman in 1982 and She's Strange in 1984. That same year, she was set to play the role of Apollonia in Prince's movie, Purple Rain. But due to a dispute with Prince, she refused to play the role and decided to play Laura Charles in The Last Dragon instead. 
After leaving Prince and his group, she signed with Motown Records as a solo artist, releasing two albums that had a mild success on the US pop and R&B charts with a handful of singles. She also blessed the cover of Playboy twice, once in May 1985 and again April 1988. During that period, Vanity became highly addicted to smoking crack cocaine. She met and got engaged in 1987 to Motley Crue bassist Nikki Six, who was also addicted to drugs. Six overdosed and nearly died that year they got engaged. In early 1992, Vanity became a born again Christian and decided not to take any more sexualized roles. In 1994, she was hospitalized with only three days left to live with her kidneys shutting down after a crack cocaine overdose. She lost both kidneys and had internal bleeding with blood clots on the brain and was completely blind and deaf.